males, five are females, and six of them had an underlying medical condition. The median age of the additional cases was uh, 86. Uh, and we'd like, again, to extend our condolences to the families and to the friends of each of the people who's lost their lives as a result of COVID-19. Of the 2,475 cases that were analysed in more detail up to Saturday the, the 28th of March, the night before last, 50% of those are male. Uh, there are 111 clusters involving 428 of those cases. The median age of all of those confirmed cases is 47. Uh, again, a, approximately a quarter of them, 645, have been hospitalised. Up to Saturday night, 84 of those cases had been admitted to intensive care, uh, and 23%, or 578, were associated with healthcare workers. And Dublin, again, continues to have the highest portion of the total number of cases at 1,393, or 56%. And we have some initial um, uh, information from our twice-weekly Amoric survey. 89% uh, of the public reporting that they are happy uh, with the various measures that are now in place. 94% uh, believing that they, can, they have confidence that they can commit to adhering to those measures and 85% of people uh, reporting that they're already adapting their behaviour to, um, to those measures. I'm going to introduce now Professor uh, Philip Nolan, the President of Maynooth University, who's leading our modelling team to say some uh, additional uh, remarks to you by way of uh, introduction to the modelling data. Philip. Thank you, Tony. Um, so just to, to start at the beginning, um, we know that in the early stage of an epidemic, or if an epidemic is uncontrolled, that you're going to get very rapid growth in the number of cases. You're going to get exponential growth in the, in the number of cases. And so the first step that we took as a, a modeling group uh, was to uh, forecast what that unmitigated epidemic might look like. And that's where the very early numbers of if we couldn't control the spread of this disease you might see as many as uh, 15,000 cases in Ireland by the end of March. And that's also where the drive to flatten the curve came from. And that unmitigated situation, uh, that worst case scenario, is uh, displayed uh, as the black curve on the chart here behind me. So there was that very strong drive to, to flatten the curve with a series of escalating public health measures uh, introduced uh, over the last two weeks. And I suppose in one sense, uh, the good news is uh, that we are far below that unmitigated uh, scenario. Uh, so as today, um, when we're announcing uh, 295 new cases and 2,910 cases in total, uh, even though you, that's a concern to be announcing any increase in cases at all, we have to remember that in an unmitigated scenario, we would have been looking at perhaps 3,000 new cases uh, today and 15,000 cases in total. So that the measures that the state has imposed and the public have really uh, complied with very, very strongly are having an enormous effect on the number of actual cases that we're seeing now today. Another very important marker that we're monitoring is in the very early stages of this epidemic, there was a day-on-day -day growth rate in new cases and cumulative cases of 33%. So each day you were seeing 33% more cases than the preceding day, and therefore the numbers were mounting up very, very quickly. If you look back over the last week, just taking the average over the last five days, that rate is down to 15%. And that is actually a huge decrease uh, in the rate uh, of exponential growth. And the last thing that I want to say about, about modeling data at the moment is that we know that it's going from the characteristics of the disease that it's going to take at least 7 to 14 days for any given public health measure to have its full effect. So we should be seeing the effects of early interventions like school and university closures now, uh, but it will take some time well into next week before we'll see the full effect of the measures that were taken uh, last Friday. So this has allowed us to revise um, our short-term forecasts and the different coloured lines behind me are what we would forecast for the next uh, week or so out to the 12th of April under different assumptions and different scenarios. 
and the model is very sensitive to the assumptions that we make, and these assumptions are based on the best available data. And I just want to say two things in, in, in closing. Um, I, I know that many of you are going to want me to be able to make some firm prediction about the future over the coming weeks. Uh, when will some surge come? How big will it be? It's just not possible to make that prediction at this time. And the reason is, as I say, the models are very sensitive to assumptions. We don't know yet what the full effect of the measures that have been taken will be. It's very heartening to see the level of public compliance with them, but we need another week to 10 days to fully understand that those measures that people have taken, how much they suppress uh, the spread of the disease. Uh, the second thing I need to say is there is no room for complacency. We've got the growth rate down from 33% to closer to 15%. We need to get that very close to zero in order to manage uh, this outbreak. And then my final comment is the work that I'm presenting here today uh, is done by a team of over 50 people from across uh, the university sector and other agencies. Uh, I'm simply representing their work and I, I'm really grateful to them for what they've done uh, under the circumstances to date. As we are to you, Philip, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm also going to introduce Dr. Siobhan Sullivan, who's our Chief Bioethics Officer, who's going to speak to you about the work that she's been leading on the ethical framework for decision making in a pandemic. Siobhan. Thank you, Tony. So you may be aware that on Friday, the Department of Health published an ethical framework for decision making in a pandemic. Uh, the purpose of the document was to really assist uh, those who have to make decisions, both in terms of planning, but also clinical decisions, um, to use best ethical principles um, in order to guide those decisions so that we can ensure that we make the best use of resources and we do that in a way which is fair. Um, the framework contains several, seven different principles. I suppose the ones I, I think I'd like to highlight are, are minimizing harm. That's obviously where we start in a public health emergency. It's ensuring that we can protect the public uh, from the harm that is, um, is being wrought by COVID-19. Solidarity is another extremely important principle that should guide our decision making. We're all very interconnected. We're in a small country. There's hardly anyone that is not going to be touched by COVID-19. And that requires us to all work together to ensure that we can minimize harm. So fairness is another one of the principles. And that's obviously um, about distributing our resources, which may become constrained over time, in a way that is fair, in a way that is um, equitable, effective, and really recognizes the moral equality of actually every citizen, every person who lives in this country. Uh, there's also this uh, principle of duty to provide care. Now, obviously, our healthcare workers are doing enormous work um, in, that, uh, in that respect. And therefore, we have a duty to them in terms of reciprocity, which is another one of the principles in the framework, to ensure that we do our very best because we recognize that they are taking a disproportionate burden upon themselves in caring for us. And therefore, we have a responsibility to them to do what we can to ensure that there are not um, as many uh, hospital admissions or, or need for caring. There's also the issue that we all need to care for each other in society, and that's very much about solidarity and reciprocity. So I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you very much, Yvonne. We're happy now to take any questions that you may have. Virgil. Um, can I just ask you about... Um Testing. I mean, I'm not sure who can answer this, but I, I have a, I've been sent details of someone who's waiting um, 12 days for a test result. So this test would have been done in the community test center in Navan. Uh, and I'm wondering how can it be that someone's waiting 12 days for a test result um, when it really should only be a few days for a turnaround? I wonder who can answer that. Yeah. I can't answer an individual case, Fergal. We'll just, uh, just go back to uh, briefly, on March 24th, we, as you know, we changed the case definition to make it more tighter and more focused, and we know from the proportion of positive results coming out that that, test, that, that change in case definition is now allowing us to focus, uh, bring much greater value to the testing we're doing. Um, we also know that since the case definition changed and became tighter, that the number of people being referred for testing has gone down considerably, again, to a more focused, high-risk priority group. 
Um, we, have, we have faced some constraints. We've been open about that from the beginning, including the testing kit, um, and uh, that led to difficulties in some of the testing centres in the past few days, where we replenished th that stock today, uh, from, and we're, we're hopeful for continuous supply of that again in a very competitive international market. We also face big challenges in the reagent in the labs, and this again is a global, uh, a, a global issue uh, right across the world. There's a great deal of competition for the reagent in the labs, and um, at a time when we expanded our lab capacity from the NVRL to 12 hospitals, uh, uh, Cherry Orchard, Department of Agriculture, and so on, uh, we're somewhat constrained by the amount of testing we can do by the lab capability as it's, as it's provided for by reagent. But we're, we're pursuing a number of sources. It has led to delays, um, but we're still hopeful that we'll be able to continue to identify and test those priority groups. But there will be delays because of these lab issues. And in relation to the 84 cases that have been admitted to ICU, is that the total figure that have gone into ICU, or are we getting, you know, what is the total number of people who actually have gone into ICU as a result of COVID-19, the actual total figure? So, so that 84 is the total as notified at the HPSC as of Saturday night just gone. There have obviously been further admissions over the course of, and that's the way we give that breakdown. So there's a little lag, of, if you like, in terms of that. So that's not the total. So we'll give you tomorrow the total as of midnight last night, and that's the way we'll continue to report until we, we have more real-time information to give you. If I may just add in relation to the testing, that to take the opportunity, Fergal, to again say that in respect of any individual who's waiting for a test result, to assume that that test result will be positive, we're advising that individuals take the appropriate public health action, because that is the measure that's going to prevent spread, and the public health action in this case uh, is to assume that you have the illness, to isolate yourself for 14 days, and the contacts in your house, your household contacts, should also restrict their movements for that time period. Uh, and, and that is the measure that will prevent transmission. We're confident that that measure will have an impact on the progression of the disease because, as we've seen over the course of the last number of weeks, the number of contacts reported for each case that has been contact traced by the contact tracing teams has continued to fall. It fell from over 20 uh, a fortnight ago to 10 uh, about a week, 10 days ago, to five before the weekend, and it continues to fall. And for the most part, the contacts now of cases identified in the community are the people that you live with. So the really important measure for you, if you have these symptoms, if your GP has, has identified you as meeting the case definition and wants you to be tested, if you're waiting for longer than we would like you to be waiting for a test, if, we're waiting, if you're waiting longer than you'd like to wait yourself for a test, isolate yourself and your family. That is the measure that's going to prevent the transmission of this virus. And if I can just ask Professor Nolan, do you expect that, say, in seven to ten days, you'll be able to come back to us here and give us... Uh, a more refined uh, projection on, on the surge situation, given what you've said. And are you able to say where we are in relation to the surge at this point? What, what, where are we on the graph at, the, at this point? So, yes, the, the clearer the picture, the more accurately we're going to be able to forecast the few months after uh, the, the 12th of April. So predictions will get better um, over time. We're still on the very early stages of that graph. So what we can say is when you, the classic graph that's been shown now for two weeks with the peak and a very flattened curve. So clearly we're flattening the curve. And by definition, that pushes the peak further out. And that's good news. That, that's what we want. Uh, it, it, we need a lot more information before we can tell you how far out and how big that is. But the bottom line is we really need to suppress that curve. We need to flatten it much more than is shown on that chart, actually, uh, in order to make it a manageable epidemic. And that's why uh, the, the key message is if you suspect you have this disease, or you really must ensure that you infect nobody else. If you, inf if you infect more than one person on average, collectively, we're going to find it very difficult to manage this. Uh, Shane Beatty from News Talk. Just on the issue of testing, I don't know who wants to take that. Do we have a figure now? You've lots of different numbers. Do we have a number now on what the average wait time is for a test? And also, what's the average wait time to get a result once that test has been carried out? Yeah, I don't have specific uh, times in those, Shane. Um, as I say, we face considerable difficulty uh, securing the kit for testing, and we now have a delivery 
today we, we, we're confident we have a secure delivery now to allow people to be swabbed. Uh, with the lab, um, we, as I said earlier, we face considerable challenges, as all do labs, as all labs do internationally, in, in securing reagent, which is necessary for securing this test. So it has led to delays. I can't quantify that yet. It's variable because uh, clearly we're, we're focusing now, we're testing on priority groups, but um, we're, we're trying to clear this as quickly as we can. But reiterate that advice, uh, lest it hasn't been here the first time. The, the most important thing is that people who are referred there once they've been screened by their GP, self-isolate with their family members. That's what will break the transmission of the virus. The testing it, it makes little or no difference to their clinical state. It's their behaviours will actually make a difference to themselves and to society. And can, can we say now, Colm, that we won't have a repeat of over the weekend where test centres were closed? Um, well, we, again, we've been absolutely open with this from the beginning, Shane. We, had, we faced huge difficulty getting swabbing equipment in, again, facing that international um, uh, scramble, if you like, to, to, to secure not just testing equipment but lab, lab uh, equipment too. So um, we're more confident that we'll be able to supply the, that swabbing equipment to our centres in, uh, in the coming days, it will build back up again, but it, we, we'll be doing that in tandem with building up that lab and securing that reagent, which we're, is, is, is at a point of uncertainty at the moment, but we're pursuing several sources internationally, we're, we're hopeful. Um, Tony, if I could ask you, given what, um, what Professor Philip Nolan has, has analysed with the modelling, clearly we are making inroads, and, and clearly it is positive. Some people will wonder, did some people become infected unnecessarily? Did some people die unnecessarily? Because the measures are clearly working. If they'd have been brought in sooner, could we have saved lives? Could we have saved infection? So uh, we, we watched, as, as we said from the beginning, the progress of this epidemic from the very start. Uh, uh, and to look for the kinds of evidence and the changes that we were seeing in the progression of this illness to, to time the implementation of the various different measures, the three stages in which we stepped up measures, uh, societal measures, to complement the measures that were in place from the very start, because we had measures in place from the very start that were focused on the right kinds of behaviours, hand washing, respiratory etiquette, identifying and knowing the symptoms, knowing how to respond and, and to, uh, to make contact with the health service, to ensure that the front line of general practice the front line then behind that of public health in terms of contact tracing was all in place. So that was in place in the get-go before any cases arose here. Uh, the societal measures that you're then talking, talking about, which are the three stages where we ask society, if you like, as a collective, to take on uh, the burden, uh, and it has been a substantial burden on, on, on society, of changing behaviours, whether that's in terms of education, uh, uh, how we operate in society, and how ultimately we operate in the workplace. And we've asked a very significant amount of, of people in each of those stages. We knew ever before we asked for the first set of those stages that that would be a substantial ask, that the question of people's compliance with that would be critical to the effectiveness of that. We would need people to understand and to buy in and to stay the course with us with the implementation of those measures. And that if we were to institute them too early, what that would do was lead to fatigue, if you like, on the part of the population. With those measures, compliance would reduce and they would become less effective. So although these measures are in place across society, they ultimately depend on the willingness and the actions and the cooperation, which has been really good across the population. And we've asked at each of the stages that while we've asked a lot of people and we believe that it's having an impact, we believe we need to do more. Because as Professor Nolan has said, while we've changed our growth rate from 33% to 15% and we've shown significant progress in, do, in doing, we need to make more progress. The, 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 the line that we're on at the moment uh, is a line that will still create a challenge for us as it peaks at a point in the future that may be further than it would have otherwise peaked. But the, 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 the package of measures that we've asked of society as a whole was instituted at the right time in respect of each of the stages uh, and at a point that, that was not too early and risk then the fatigue and the losing the effectiveness, of the effectiveness of those measures and ultimately the, the impact that that would have had in, in limiting the extent to which you could prevent transmission of the infection. And just briefly for me then, finally, the, I know you don't like the phrase lockdown, but people do interpret what you recommended on Friday as a lockdown. What's your message to Irish people who think that if they comply with all of the measures and if they take on board everything that's been done, that they think that we will get back to some sort of normality on the day after Easter Sunday? 
So uh, we don't believe that things are going to change to the extent that there would be no measures required by society at that point. What we've said is we've asked for an additional range of measures on Friday of last uh, week, and government announced those on Friday night, uh, and they commenced from midnight on Friday, and we've asked for those to continue until, until uh, Easter Sunday night, which is the 12th of April. We will keep uh, the progress of this disease under review right the way through that period. We'll keep the effectiveness of these measures under review. Uh, we believe we've asked a, hu a huge amount of society. We will want to lift these measures as soon as we reasonably can. We won't recommend the lifting of these measures any point earlier than is responsible for us to do so. Um, Tony, um, I'm still trying to understand Friday's measures. Uh, so the way I see them is um, a large section of the population has been implementing the previous set of measures, and they're being asked to double down on those. Um, so you're getting adherence from people who already provided adherence, and yet the measures had nothing to say about travel across international borders, um, and borders close to home on this island as well, where on the other side of the border with the north, you've got a different political philosophy, you've got different periods of self-isolation, you've much less testing. So why is it that so many of us can't travel two kilometers from our home when people seem to be able to travel uh, willy-nilly across borders? So uh, we, we look at the whole question of travel, both within the country and internationally, and on a continuing basis. Uh, and in relation to international travel, there's a series of measures in place. Uh, and we know that the footfall through the international borders that now exist uh, onto the island, ship and air transport, we believe, have reduced by over 90%. So we've seen a huge reduction in, in the amount of travel into the country. We now have measures in place and recommendations that anybody travelling onto the island from overseas uh, subjects themselves to uh, a 14 day uh, self quarantine period and we'll keep the whole issue under review. We meet again as a national public health emergency team tomorrow morning and the question of measures in relation to uh, travel within the island, travel onto the island will be again on the agenda. But for now uh, we think that the, the, the measures that we have already in, got in place, not just in Ireland but in the international community, the reality around the impact that, that has had on commercial travel the recommendations we've made on people uh, around avoiding travel outside of the country, the recommendations that we have in place around self-quarantine uh, of people coming back into the country have significantly reduced the, the, the uh, travel, particularly air travel, into the country through the airports uh, to, to more than 90% of, of what it was. Uh, but we'll keep the, those measures uh, under review. We know that the European Union is looking at measures uh, across the whole of the, of the community around the potential uh, um, uh, limitation, if you like, of movement of populations from outside of the European Union into the, um, into, in, into the, the region as a whole. We'll keep the whole set of measures uh, under review and we won't rule anything in or rule anything out. We'll give that further consideration again tomorrow. And that will include questions of movement on the island. And just what about the other side of that equation? I mean, if you were to listen to Liveline today, there seems to be quite a lot of resistance among over 70s to the notion that they should be cocooned away for a long period. Uh, I didn't hear Liveline today. Um, and, and for the most part, uh, our sense is that there's a very high degree of compliance. In fact, a lot of the anecdotal evidence uh, is suggesting that long before we recommended that measure formally on Friday night, that many people over the age of 70 in particular many people with the underlying conditions that we've identified for cocooning purposes, we're already in fact, in fact practicing that. Uh, and we will, through the market research work that we have in place, recommend, uh, or, sorry, measure that and, 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 and attempt to try to quantify what the actual level of compliance is um, uh, in relation to that. We know that that particular measure of cocooning is a very hard and difficult measure and challenging measure for people. For people over the age of 70, it's effectively asking them to cut, to cut themselves off from their wider families, often from grandchildren. That's a really hard thing for people to do. It's a hard thing to, for us to ask. And so we didn't, we held that measure until we felt we'd arrived at a point where we now had to ask more. We had already recommended that people in those vulnerable groups limit their social movements in as much as is practically possible, more than the rest of society, if you like. Uh, but we felt we needed to go the extra step with the measures that we, we recommended to government on Friday. 
Just a quick point of clarification. Uh, I was asked to ask this. And the measure said um, uh, that people should take individual or could take individual physical activity outside. I presume that individual embraces a family that's under the one. It does, no, we're, and I, th I think we were, I hope we were clear about that. It, it, it'll include you and the people that you live with, the people who are your household contacts. So the practical situation of a parent with young children going for a walk in the park, not encountering other people and staying socially distanced from them and staying within the area that they live, within that two kilometre uh, region. We think that that's, that's the kind of thing that we have in mind. We think that's, that's okay. And can I ask Professor Nolan, um, so when are you saying now that you expect the curve to peak, no matter how flat it is, at what number of cases? And actually, I'm more interested in other ways of measuring this, such as um, are you measuring, for example, the curve by ICU admissions? hospitalizations, uh, deaths even, and can you give us any hard figures in relation t to the progress of the curve in the coming weeks, according to your modeling? So, so that, that's my, my fundamental point, is that to project out several weeks or months at this point is inappropriate, because the assumptions that we would have to make are too broad, and the answers that we would get would be too broad. We need to wait until next week till we can see the full impact of the measures that have been taken last Friday in particular, but the preceding measures, before we can say this is a reasonable set of assumptions to put into the model and this is when the, the surge or the peak might occur. But the bottom line is the better we do in terms of stopping the spread of this disease, the later that peak is going to be and the lower it's going to be. If we were to project forward from where we are right now, we would find ourselves in an unmanageable position. So the objective is that the measures have greater effect over the next week and we're projecting forward to a manageable position. Hi, uh, Tony Conal Thomas from the journal. I, um, I just have two questions, um, or three questions, sorry, two on um, healthcare workers and one on testing. Um, it was reported earlier that one in four doctors in the UK, in the NHS, um, are sick or in isolation at the moment. Just wondering if you have any proportion of figures for Ireland. And also, on the clusters in nursing homes... One, did you say one in four doctors? One in four NHS doctors, yeah. Okay. And then on nursing homes, um, you've obviously expressed concerns about the clusters. Just wondering, in, regarding staff in those nursing homes, are you guaranteeing that they'll get PPE equipment, for instance, to stop the spread of the virus? Uh, so, in, in, in relation to doctors, uh, I don't have an equivalent figure. It's not one in four in this country. We've seen a significant number of healthcare workers who've been infected with this. We've been beginning to look at that uh, in, in, in a way, and looking at the numbers, particularly in hospital situations where uh, the numbers of cases in hospitals, the numbers of staff in hospitals, and giving us a sense that maybe there's more transmission among staff than among patients, which uh, it's too early for us to draw any real conclusions from this. It raises the possibility of staff uh, being infected in other situations other than just through their work, through contact outside of the work. And I think we've shared with you information in the past, a portion of all of healthcare worker infections that are attributable to those healthcare workers having picked up the infection in travel overseas. So it wouldn't be right to conclude, and I'm not suggesting that you are, uh, that the healthcare worker number represents transmission to healthcare workers in the course of their work. And that's one of the things that we're looking to try and as it were, disentangle and understand better as we, as we deal with the whole question around healthcare workers. Uh, in relation to the question of PPE, uh, I'll let Dr. Henry come in relation to that. That is one component of a range of components, I think, that we want to look more closely at as to how we can, how, as to how we can protect people in nursing home environments uh, in the first instance from picking up this infection. We have seen a number of clusters in nursing homes. Uh, the populations in nursing homes, that you, I don't, you don't need me to tell you, are particularly vulnerable. Uh, we want to do the best job that we can of protecting them uh, from this uh, infection. Uh, and the staff, we also want to protect, both for themselves and for any risk that that might uh, entail to the patients that they're looking after. But I might let Dr. Henry deal with the yeah, question. Just briefly, uh, yes. we were very relieved to see the first shipment land yesterday, and it's the first of many, so it's a, it's a great uh, relief to us and to our staff who are carrying out all this work on all our behalves at the front line. And that's in the front line in, in the community and in hospitals. So we, the moment uh, we, we, we were in receipt of this first shipment, we set up a process to track in real time where the greatest need is, whether it's a nursing home, whether it's a testing centre, or whether it's a hospital. And we will be distributing the PPE to the areas of greatest need in real time. 
I can assure you of that. It will, it will not be selective to hospitals, it will be in the community as well. But just to echo that point, there's much more in, in terms of the, the priority. It, obviously protecting our, our staff is, is a significant priority for us. But, but the best way to do that is to break the transmission of the virus and the community. It, it, it's certainly our view that the nursing homes require a great deal of support because hospitals uh, is part of their uh, everyday work and uh, the, in some ways they're much greater resource from that point of view. So we'd be supporting nursing homes and focusing particularly on those nursing homes where there are outbreaks to see what, what support we can give them to break the transmission of the virus and protect patients and staff. Uh, Dr. Henry, it was, it was also, I know you already touched on the testing a bit. Um, it was reported earlier today that Parky Cueve was closed. Um, is it due to reopen tomorrow and are uh, Croke Park and Tala still open for testing? Well, as I said earlier, uh, we, we did face uh, challenges securing the testing equipment. That's a swab. Uh, we received a shipment today and we have further shipments coming in, in, in coming days. And we also faced challenges, as I said, in, um, in, in securing the reagents for labs, and that has constrained the amount of testing we could do. But uh, with, the, with the arrival of, of testing equipment, uh, we will be reopening some of these centres and also our ability to test will depend to a great deal on us securing the reagent to allow the labs to process those samples and produce the test. The advice remains the same. Uh, the test in itself, I know it's a hard message for people to get who are, who are worried or impatient. It doesn't make any difference to their clinical state. The test is done for public health reasons so that we all get a better idea of, of, of where we are with this virus in society and we can trigger the surveillance and contact tracing. So the advice remains the same to these people. Isolate yourselves and your family for 14 days and break the transmission of the virus. Uh, Tony, finally, I've asked you this a few times. Um, it's regarding figures of people who have recovered from the virus. Are they available yet? Um, so that's one of the things we want to be able to do. Uh, and the, the information systems that we're building and the analysis that we're building will give us an ability to be able to track the entire patient journey from the point of diagnosis in the community uh, through hospitals for those who are admitted to hospitals right through to the point of recovery and include also information arising from the community. We don't have that information at the moment. When we do have that information, we, we will provide it to you, which is not to say at all that we, we, we're not aware that significant numbers of people have recovered and recovered very successfully, uh, particularly in the community and people who've, who will have self-isolated for the 14-day period. Uh, um, we're saying once they've completed that 14-day period uh, with five, the last five days without a temperature, that they're safe to, um, to go back, if you like, to their, 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 normal, uh, their normal lives. And there have been uh, quite a number of discharges from people who've been hospitalised as opposed to hospitalised in intensive care units. But we, will, we do want to make that data available to you. We're in the process of trying to um, uh, um, uh, develop the information systems and the, and, the, and the data to be able to provide that analysis to you. And when we have it, we will. Uh, Richard Downs from RT Prime Time for you, Dr. Holland. And it's a development of uh, Connell's question. I just have one, which is um, the percentage of Irish healthcare workers testing positive as a uh, proportion of the overall it appears to be higher in Ireland, doesn't it, than other countries, at least from what published data we can find, 20 to 25 percent, depending on, on, on the period. In Italy, it appears to be about 9 percent. In Spain, the most reliable figure is of the order of 15 percent. So do you have a, an idea as to why this might be and how much of a concern it is for you? Uh, so obviously we're concerned uh, with anybody who's infected, particularly healthcare workers. Uh, obviously healthcare workers, both their own welfare and the protection of any patients that they look after is paramount in our concern. We've said from the get-go that protecting our population uh, requires us to protect our workforce. I think one of the issues about drawing comparisons between countries is I think we have to be careful because there's no question but that within our information here, uh, there's quite an amount of uh, infection that has occurred in our healthcare worker population that has occurred as a result, as I've said earlier, of travel into the country, has, a recur has occurred as a result of healthcare workers picking this up in, in the form of community transmission, and healthcare workers picking this up perhaps in social circumstances in which they socialise together, uh, and that has happened. And uh, the extent to which, to which that, 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 that arises will vary between different countries and different countries will pick that up to a greater rate. We are testing at a greater rate than most countries in Europe and so therefore we will pick up more healthcare workers as we will pick up others uh, in the population through community transmission and so on. Uh, to make uh, a direct conclusion from that, that each of, and I'm not suggesting Richard that this is what you're doing, uh, that of, of that number uh, that they have picked up, that this represents, if you like, the scale of transmission of 
what we call nosocomial infection, infection passed either from staff to patients or from patients to staff. Uh, we think that's a much, much lower figure, and it's something we want to really focus in on uh, as we look more closely at both nursing homes and hospitals and transmission in both of those, those settings. But we don't think that, that, that we have a substantially different problem uh, in terms of transmission of infection in healthcare environments in this country as compared to most other developed countries. Hi, Kira Feeling from the Irish Mayor. Just um, to one of yourself, our column, I don't know which one of you wants to take this, but again, it's in relation to testing. I think I'm too small. And, oh, we, can, um, we can lower that, we can lower sorry. that. You don't. I think I'm okay there. Um, just in relation to people who have said that they are waiting for uh, over a week for their test results, have we any clarity on if tests, how long it takes before they expire on the slide? Yes, we have some idea of uh, the length of time and Killian the Gaskin has answered this question before. We are trying to get through this uh, list of, uh, of people who are waiting and, and um, as I said, we, we, we have a significant problem with the reagent and this is a global problem. Uh, we're intent on getting those priority cases done with the change case definition last week. Um, I would ask people to be patient. It's difficult, and uh, but regardless of what we can do, depending on this flow of reagent, the f advice remains the same. Please keep isolated with your family for 14 days. Break the transmission of the virus. We are trying to, our best to get through these tests, notwithstanding the huge challenges we face. But the advice remains the same. That's how they can play their part. The test itself does not make a difference to their clinical status. No difference. I understand that, but apologies, I have to ask you. Are you aware that this, some slides have expired while people are waiting? I, I'm not aware of any expired slides at this stage. I would tell you if I was. Okay. And uh, yourself, Professor Nolan, I suppose, sadly, there are another eight deaths here, but this, would, this press conference would serve as a bit of good news today, considering the news that you have told us. Are you worried that people might get complacent? And secondly, could you tell me a ballpoint figure? You said it'd be a week to 10 days before we see a significant drop from the measures that have been put in place. How confident are you that we will see a significant decrease in numbers? So I, I, I actually want to transmit the opposite message. I think people need to redouble the efforts that they're making to prevent the spread of infection from one person to another through the measures that public health have advised. And, and if they continue to do that, I do expect to see the growth rate uh, fall over the next week. That's what we're working towards collectively. So quite the opposite. The message here is uh, we, we want to protect the population from this disease. We want to keep them out of hospital and out of intensive care. Uh, so the, the effort needs to continue uh, to ensure there is no, no spread of the disease. And if that happens, then we will see improvements in these and we'll see more favourable scenarios uh, out into the future. Lastly, Tony, you mentioned there that you had, you were aware that some people had been uh, discharged from hospital. Could you say that it was a case that they were sent home into isolation or is it a case that they have been um, cleared of the virus? So people are sent home from if, hospital if, yeah. when they're clinically well enough to do and in some, some of those circumstances they'll be sent home to, 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 to finish out, if you like, their recovery in a, in a, in a, in a, in a home environment and other situations. Uh, it may well be that they have been sent home after, if you like, the period of infection. And that'll, that's a clinical decision and that will vary in different patients.